In your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 2. And these fill-ins are very, very simple. You'll get them right away. But I want you to follow along with a real pattern that's so important for you and I to catch because Pastor Tom has been doing such a wonderful shepherding teaching about your heart and my heart. That's what he did last week. That's what he's been covering the last few weeks. I want to take a little view of today, not our heart so much, but the heart of God and how it does relate to our heart. And to do that, I want to start off with Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. Now, this will be in the New International Version. So if you have a different version, it's kind of confusing. Obviously, you can follow along on, on PowerPoint. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Everybody say living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east of Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How many can remember when you were growing up in grade school, or maybe kindergarten, and somebody would ask you the question by your first name, they'd call your name, and they'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Anyone ever got asked that when you were little? I think we all did, right? If you would have asked me that question when I was about four or five years old, I would have said, I want to be a Major League Baseball player. (laughs) And actually, when you think about those kind of thoughts, when someone asks you that question, what you're really saying is, my dream, the dream I have in my future is to be, for me, a Major League Baseball player. And what was your dream? Most likely, most of our childhood dreams were just what they were, childhood dreams that probably never came came true, and maybe sometimes they do. But the reality is, God has given us dreams, and he has, those are dreams that he has inspired and put in our heart to still believe him for. Some of us have seen dreams come true that God gave us years ago, and some are still believing for those dreams to come true today or in the future. But when I had that wonderful dream of being a Major League Baseball player, reality set in for me because in my fourth grade year in, in grade school, I broke this arm three times in one year. Now, when you have some time and you want to get entertained or you just want to get bored, ask me how I broke those that arm three times. There's nothing dramatic or anything uh, life-saving about it or, or miraculous. It's really stupid. When you hear how I broke my arm three times, but if you know me a little bit, you can figure out that I probably did something quirky. And believe me, I did. But when you break your arm three times in a year, the doctor tells you right away, if you don't get that thing flexing, you're going to have a tough time. And to this day, I I really can't flex that wrist like most people can. When I get change in the store, the change falls right right off my hand. I got to use this hand all the time. Well, that affected my my curveball in Little League, right? That affected me to swing a baseball bat. I still love baseball, but guess what? I'm never going to be signed by any team, that's for sure, and never was. So sometimes those dreams just can't happen because of reality. But when God gives you a dream... It's because what I want to show you this morning is if you want to know his heart, and that's what we're talking about today, he has a dream. Everybody say, God has a dream. dream. And if you you really want to take a look at not just the heart that Pastor Tom's been teaching us so powerfully about, and you want to take a look at our our Lord, our, our creator, his heart, you must understand what motivates him to dream. What has he been dreaming about from the beginning of time? What's he dreaming about right now for you in this sanctuary? And what, how does that dream carry on for, for eternity? I want to key on a very key verse that we just read, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Think about that picture of the living being. We've been hearing so powerfully that we are comprised And we're going to have a little test right here. I believe we have some spaces for you to fill in right here. Let's see if they come up. Here we go. Pastor Tom's been teaching us the components of our being. What's that first S? Who wants to guess? Man, you guys are pretty sharp. Spirit. How about the H? Man, I'm impressed. I'm going to tell Pastor Tom how well you did. How How about the S? Soul. How about the M? Nobody knows the B. Well, you know what? When God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he breathed a spirit, a heart, a soul, 
a mind, and, a, and of course, he already formed, he'd formed the body in terms of the way he formed man. And so, when you look at that, I want to propose something to you this morning. We all know it was a sad day when God had to cast Lucifer out of heaven because he decided, Lucifer decided he was going to pe compete with God, and that's not going to happen in heaven, is it? Happen anywhere. So when he gets cast out, I believe sometime along that time or somewhere in eternity, God had a dream, and his dream is happening right here in front of what we just read. He said, he's, he's forming a man in his own likeness, his own image. He's breathing into man, and he's making man a spirit, heart, soul, mind, and body. Now, let me focus on the actual dream itself. Take a look at verse 8 again. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Notice this. Trees that were pleasing to the eye. Everybody say, pleasing to the eye. Pleasing to the eye. And everybody say, and good for food. Simple thing, but God was so thrilled about his dream coming true, and now he has this being, a living being, that he's put his own breath into, and he said, let's make something that this being that he calls Adam have a joy at viewing and looking at. And, of course, the trees and the nature was such an exciting thing for Adam to behold, and God knew it would be that, and he's so thrilled that his dream is coming true. And they thought, well, let's make the vegetation and the fruit have good taste. Anyone like a good taste of a nice peach when it's just right? Well, come on. How about a strawberry? How about a corn on the cob? I'm, I'm not going to things I'm not supposed to eat right now. <laughs> Bonnie made some incredible lemon cupcakes today, and my wife wasn't here, so I cheated, and I have one. But she's right here right now, so I'm in trouble now. <laughs> but it was, good for t it was good for taste. Good for taste. And God was excited that Adam would enjoy that. In fact, he, he gave Adam a privilege in verse 19 of naming all the animals, the, 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 uh, the, 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 bir the birds in the sky, the wild animals, the, the livestock, every creature. Adam had the privilege of naming those animals, and today those names still stand, and that's what we know, know them as today. But here's even a little deeper motive. I want you to look back at chapter 1 in Genesis of verse 26, and let's see what really was motivating God to, to see a dream announced. Who did he announce it to? Well, the Godhead, for the first time in Scripture, they announce it to one another. We have this phrase in verse number 26. God said, let us make. Everybody say, let us make. Let us make. Who do you think us might be? Father, Son. Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the Godhead having this incredible conference. And they've said, it's time to, to announce our dream because they know that there's been a real problem since Lucifer has been cast out. And he's saying, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Take a look at the real deep motive and why God is so excited about his dream beginning to, to, to become a reality. Because now, not only has he, knowing he's going to breathe into the nostrils and, and the man's going to become a living being, but the exciting thing is man is someone he's created to be like himself. And the thing, first thing I want to talk about right now, when you look about God, God, at God's dream from man, here it is. He wants a friend like him. Let's all say that. He wants a friend like him. One more time. He wants a friend like him. And that's you this morning. Do you realize when God sees you right now sitting in this sanctuary, he knows you're just like him. He made you just like him. So wait a minute, God is so powerful. I'm this little puny human being. Somehow, in God's powerful way of creating us, he made you and I in his likeness. How many believe that? Don't let the wicked one lie to you and tell you that somehow there's a shortcoming in the way you are, your personality, your spirit, your heart, your soul, your mind. It's, there's nothing that displeases God because he made you the way you are. And he's so excited that you've been made in his likeness. Now, let me give you a picture of the joy the Godhead must have had, especially as God the Father walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. When was the cool of the day? Probably morning, right? Let me ask you guys this. What if you on the way home today had God speak to you in an audible voice as you were driving home. It's kind of funny, right? But, 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 but would you like that? 
Or maybe not. You'd probably go off the freeway, wouldn't you? I know I would. Yeah. But what if he spoke to you in a loud voice and he said, you know what? Your pa- one of your pastors today re- reminded you that, that I used to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. How about you and me t- tomorrow morning on Monday, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and even next Sunday, a week from today, how about you and I, let me take you to a place you've never been to before. It's away from everything. It's a garden. And you and I will have the same kind of experience. God's telling you this. We're going to walk together in, in, in fellowship together every morning this week, just as I did with Adam and Eve. How many would be excited? Amen. Can you imagine what that would be like? How many think if that was reality and we had the chance to experience that, each one of us individually, in an intimate way, when you came to Church, Church of Grace next Sunday, your worship might be a little bit different. Would it have a little more perspective? When Pastor Tom taught the word, would you have a little more hunger for this, this, this word? Of course we would, because our perspective would be so much different. But Adam and Eve took it for granted. They didn't know any different. They, they were created in this dream. And they had this opportunity every morning to walk with God and to have this, this experience. God wanted a friend like him. And so he has this friend. But then, as you know, the, sour, the story turns in a sour way. I'm going to go on and finish the story. You know how it ends. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and, hid from, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Everybody say, where are you? Is there any emotion in God's voice when he says, where are you? Remember, Pastor Tom's been reminding us, it's okay to recognize we are an emotional being. We've been created in God's likeness because he is an emotional being. And for God to ask Adam, where are you? Of course, he knows where he is geographically and in terms of physical place. But he, said, he feels the disconnect right away when Adam has, has fallen and he's disobeyed. And it's, a, and it's a sad moment when all of a sudden he has to ask, Adam, where are you? You know, you know the other, only other time in the Bible where God has to ask somebody where he is? When Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? The second Adam is on the cross asking Father, Lord, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? It had to be done because Adam of his fall. But because we see that, let's go back to our little story. What if you said, Pastor Randy, it happened. God spoke to me on the way home, and he's going to take me on an experience in a garden just like Adam and Eve, just like you said. I go, are you kidding me? And and you're having this experience tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and somehow you can't even imagine how it could happen, but somehow on Thursday you choose to disobey something God tells you on those first three or four days. And all of a sudden, God doesn't show up for that appointment on Friday or Saturday. Why can't he show up? Because of disobedience. Would you come to church next Sunday feeling pretty dis- 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 discouraged, disappointed? Of course you would, because you'd had this opportunity to be with God th- throughout the whole week, and you squandered the last two or three days because of disobedience. Can you imagine, even though Adam and Eve didn't know any different in terms of what was, what was the option, once they, did, once they fell, they did, because they hid themselves, they were so ashamed, but they squandered such a wonderful opportunity. And I want you to say this, he loses a friend. God loses Adam right here. In fact, it says in the fifth chapter of Genesis, verse 5, so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Everybody say, and he died. One more time, and he died. I want you to partner with me in this message right now because I want you to see something very important. God had a dream for man to be made in his image, but now he's lost that friend. And I want us to look at chapter 5, verse 8. I'm going to read the first part of each one of these verses. And when you see the phrase, and he died, I want you to resound with your voice out loud, and he died like a choir. Here we go. Verse 8. So all the days of Seth were 912 years. And so in all the days of Enosh were 905 years. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years. So all the days of Jared were 962 years. Was there any kind of a pattern? They all died. It started with Adam's death and continued. Folks, that was a pattern that was never supposed to happen. It was breaking God's heart. And probably, even of course, God had foreknowledge. He knew what the end would be. At that point, he felt the loss of his friend. 
and the ramifications of what that meant for his dream, his dream for man. But there was a nice turn in the story. The turn in the story was in verse 22. It said, Enoch, everybody say Enoch. Enoch. Thank God for Enoch. <laughs> he lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, I always thought about, what does it mean he was not? Well, it has a lot of different meanings, but what I like to think about is what you just read out loud just now, what you just proclaimed. They died, and they died, and they died, and all of a sudden he was not. He was not what? He was not of that pattern. There was something different about Enoch that got God's attention. And I want to state to you right now that all of a sudden, after God has lost a friend, he finds a friend. Everybody say, God finds a friend. God finds a friend. But when he finds Enoch, what attracts Enoch to God? Is it his spirit? Obviously. Is it his soul? Yes. Is it his mind? Of course. Is it his body? Of course. But what really is it? It's his heart. As Pastor Tom's been reminding of us, it's a matter of everything we do from our heart is the key to everything God is paying attention to. Because God does not look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So when, at, when Enoch is taken away from all the distractions, from all the contamination, if you will, it's because something that Enoch has displayed has got God's heart's, his heart, God's heart's attention because of Enoch's heart. In fact, everybody always kind of misses the point here. They think God took Enoch to heaven, but God could not have taken Enoch to heaven. Do you know why? There had been no blood sacrifice yet. And so Enoch, was Enoch born into sin like everybody else? Yes, he was. Because of Adam's fall, from that point on, any person that's born, including you and I, we're all born into sin, and we need a Savior. So Enoch didn't have any blood covenant sacrifice yet. So where did God take him? We don't know, but we know one thing. God was so excited that somebody wanted to be his friend, he said, I'm taking this one with me so he can't get contaminated. That's just my paraphrase, but I kind of think that's the way it was. Now, does the story get better from here? Now, unfortunately, let's go to six, Genesis, chapter, Genesis chapter 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart, thoughts of what? His heart. Pay attention to that. You might want to underline that. Thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he ever, they had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Where was God grieved? In his heart. We're talking about the heart of God today. He was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry, I am sorry that I have made them. Does God have an emotion here? A deep emotion. He's grieving in his heart because man's heart has only one intention, it's to do evil. So we've gone from Enoch to all of a sudden, a, a, the days of Noah, where every intention a man had was all from his heart to do evil. And God is so sorry he's ever created man. He's grieved in his heart. Now I want you to say this, not a friend in sight. Think about it. Adam, he loses a friend. Enoch, he finds a friend. The days of Noah, he, he doesn't see a friend in sight. Now you can say these two words. Everybody say, but Noah. The next verse in chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Do you see a pattern here that God's heart was attracted to Enoch's heart? Was it possible that God's heart was attracted to Noah's heart? I think so. It says the eyes of the Lord found grace in Noah's life. Where was that grace appearing to God's eyes? It said he was a just man, he was perfect in his generations, he walked with God. How many believed that, believed that Noah's heart was something that God was attracted to? I believe that. Because his heart was saying, here's another person that we created in our likeness that has a heart for us, the Godhead, has a heart for God. And so because of that, everybody say, God finds another friend. So as we're doing this right now, are you a friend of God? 
Could you sing that song with Pastor Scott today? Thanks to, I appreciate him honoring my request. And you found yourself saying, yeah, Lord, I am your friend. Because he was wanting us to resound that song out because he's telling you, when you show up in these doors on a Sunday to be a part of our worship team, a family of worshiping the Lord together as a family, he's saying, oh, here come my friends. Here come my friends that I created in my likeness. And their heart is for me. And I've anointed their pastor, who I've chosen to be the shepherd of this flock, to teach on their heart's condition. Because it's their heart's condition that makes everything work from that point, or not work. It's one or the other. And we see, already see two scenarios in Enoch's life and Noah's life. Now, I want us to do something that's going to be very important for the rest of this message. If you take your Bibles and turn to a very famous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse 5. How many know what people, what biblical scholars call Hebrews chapter 11? The Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. I call it the Hall of Faith because everybody in here that's famous is famous because of their faith. But something that Pastor Tom said on Easter Sunday, I, it's been resounding in my heart and, and my, in my soul ever since. He said, there is never a time when you and I can demonstrate faith without understanding it has to be a product of our heart. The faith that Enoch demonstrated, the faith that Noah demonstrated, and one other person we're going to show, talk about here was a product of their heart. So let's, take, let's, let's review Enoch one more time, and let's break it down a little, a little further. Let's look at verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found. We have no idea where God took him. He was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, Enoch had this testimony. He pleased God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently, diligently seek him. What do we say every Sunday? God is, is who he says he is. God will do what he says he will do. He will do. Enoch believed that. When Enoch believed that, it caused him to diligently, diligently seek that God that he knew existed, that he acknowledged was real, that he acknowledged was his creator, that he had a sense that his heart, there was something about him that was like his creator, and he acknowledged that. God saw that acknowledgement. God saw his heart, and he saw that he diligently sought the Lord himself in his heart. And we must believe that God is who he says he is that he will reward those of us who diligently seek him. By coming here on a Sunday, we're, we're seeking him. We're not ignoring him. And then we go down to verse number 7. By faith, Noah. Let's review Noah again. Something different here I want you to catch. Being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. It says that Noah was moved with godly fear. What does Proverbs say the fear of the Lord does? What it is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we already have a picture of Enoch diligently seeking our Lord, his, his friend. And now we have a evidence that Noah had this incredible wisdom because this wisdom brought about, he knew better than to ever, ever, take lightly what God had told him. Now, everybody made fun of Noah. Can you imagine building an ark and there's no rain? No one even knew what rain was. He's building an ark. They probably thought he was crazy, right? But out of that total reverence he had for his creator, his friend, the godly fear, if you will, he, he obeys. And what does it say happens because of that? He becomes an heir of the righteousness, which is according to what? Faith. So two common denominators and two friends. Now let's take friend number three. Anyone know where I'm going next? His starts with an A. Abraham. <laughs> Abraham. By faith, Abraham. Oh, verse 8. What did he do? He obeyed when he was called to go out. Go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. He didn't have a clue where he was going. God just said, get up and go. He does. By faith, Abraham dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For Abraham waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, I'm going to give you a clue to our message today. That is a very important verse to what I want to have you catch today about what God says about you today. That's a very, very important verse. You're going to see that as we go along. 
There's something very powerful about God showing us that in Hebrews from the very time that Abraham had this first encounter with God. But I want to point out something that's very important. Do you realize that from the years that Adam was, bo- was made and created in God's image to Enoch, you know how many years had gone by in that time span? 622 years. How many years have you and I been on this planet? Not 622, right? It seems like doesn't life seem pretty short the older you get? <laughs> I'm just going, I can't believe it. I don't even want to talk about my age right now. That's unbelievable. I know some of you feel the same way, I'm sure. But this was the, between Adam and Enoch was 622 years. How about between Enoch and Noah? Try 500 years. How about between Noah and Abraham? Try 400 years. Still a lot of years, right? Would you agree? If we took an encyclopedia somehow and had every name in black and white print of everybody who'd ever lived between Adam and Enoch, Enoch and Noah, Noah and Abraham, we would see pages and pages and pages and pages of names, black and white. But every time we saw Enoch's name, Noah's name, and Abraham, let's put those letters in red. We would be able to see so many thousands and thousands of names, on and on and on, black and white, black and white, black and white, and all of a sudden, one red name. God chose, in Hebrews chapter 11, to give us three red names, and we take it for granted. God didn't take it for granted. These are heroes for God because they had a heart for him. They trusted him. They wanted to be his friend. And he was saying, my dream is still alive because I have someone like Enoch, Noah, and Abraham who obey me, who want to seek me, who have a fear of me and the holy reverence of fear, and they have wisdom because of it. And so I'm going to make them known in Hebrews 11 as one of three of my heroes, Hall of Faith, Hall of Fame. So what do they have in common? Everything about their faith is a product of what? Their, Their heart. Where is our faith today? Is it out of our soul? Is it out of our head? Is it out of our religious understanding? Or is it out of our heart? That's what Pastor Thomas has been asking the Holy Spirit to help him convey to all of us that this whole thrust of what God wants to do in our church to have us begin to reach more and more people in Yorba Linda and Orange County, it's going to come as the Lord does something in our hearts. How many believe that? He's doing a work in our hearts. There's no doubt about that. As I say, every time I'm up in front of you folks, you're the sweetest people I've ever been around in the body of Christ. It's amazing. There's nobody here with an agenda. Don't you love that? Everybody's just down to earth, just real. And I think God has got a big smile on his face when we come in this room because, you know, even though he looks on the heart, not on the outward appearance, he's got to be going, these are some sweet people, Randy. Do you believe me? I go, God, I know. I've been been realizing that. I'm trying to remember all their names, but they're all cool. Everybody's cool. I mean, they just treat me like I'm okay, you know, and I know I'm weird and I'm quirky, but everybody just tells, hug me, loves me, and gives gives words to me and all this kind of, it's amazing, from the Holy Spirit. What what a precious thing. But see, the reality is what Pastor Tom's been getting across to us, as our heart gets a hold of how God did this for us, we begin to get more attractive to God's heart, and he begins to say, now's the time I can do what I promised you, what what your dreams are, what what they've been, the dreams I have implanted in you. I can begin to do those things now as you let this work of the Word of God, of the Holy Spirit, work in your own heart. Watch the evidence, because it's similar to what we're seeing here in Hebrews. Now, I'm going to take a little turn right here, and let's talk about God's dream through His Son. I'm going to read two stories to you. Just follow along on PowerPoint. You know the stories very well, but I want you to picture a couple things as I read these stories. Do you sense God's desire to be a friend to somebody in this first story? And do you sense God's emotion in the second story? First story number one, Mark 16, verse 4 through 7. Just look at PowerPoint. Then the women looked and saw the stone, that the stone was moved. Anybody picture where that is? We all know where that is, right? The stone was very large, but it was moved away from the entrance. The women walked into the tomb and saw a young man there wearing a white robe. Who was that young man? An angel. He was sitting on the right side of the tomb. The women were afraid. But the man said, don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus from Nazareth, the one who was killed on the cross. He has risen from death. He is not here. Look, here is the place they put him when he was dead. Notice this. Now go and tell his followers. And be sure to tell Peter. Let's all say, be sure to tell Peter. 
you think there's something going on there between God telling that angel, the Holy Spirit, that angel, to make sure that, that they tell those, those ladies, hey, go tell the followers that the stone's been rolled away and that Jesus is gone. And can, you think the women might be in a little bit of shock right here? You know, they're trying to process this, right? And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know this is, this is a surprise. Don't be afraid. But be sure you go tell the followers, and, and, oh, by the way, be sure to tell Peter. Do you sense the friendship of Jesus toward Peter? Is Peter feeling pretty bad right now at that time? Do you feel like a loser? Has he denied the Lord three times like Peter? Did Jesus prophesy? Absolutely. Is he probably feeling like he's responsible for Jesus being crucified? Probably feeling that way, isn't he? Is he hiding off, doesn't want to tell, see anybody at all? Is he ashamed? Does he feel like God probably doesn't ever want to ever talk to him again? I know I feel that way. But God is trying to say through this angel, make sure you go tell Peter. Because God is saying, I'm still your friend, Peter. There's nothing you can, you can do to break away my heart. Because I know your heart, Peter. I know you, your good intentions. Peter's one of the best stories in the Bible for all of us for a man who has good intentions. But it keeps messing up with his mouth, you know, and <laughs> interrupting the Holy Spirit, if you will. And he goes on to say, after he tells them, be sure to tell Peter, tell him that Jesus is going into Galilee and will be there before you come. You will see him there as he told you before. So can you see that there's a friendship desire? God's dream for Peter is don't you ever think that even though you've fulfilled what I said you'd do, you've denied me, that I ever would not want to be your friend. Now let's take it a different step toward a very familiar story in John chapter 11, verse 21 through 36. This is the Message Bible. And I want you to see, do you see any emotion in Jesus here? See if you see soul and mind versus heart. See if you see that in this familiar story. This is where, of course, Lazarus has, de has died. And his sister Martha is having a conversation with Jesus. And she says, Master, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, he will give you. Jesus said, your brother will be raised up. Martha replied, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end time. When Martha said that statement to Jesus, I know that he will be raised up in the resurrection at the end time, did she say that from her heart or from her soul? She said it from her soul. And that's what gets Jesus' attention. She hasn't, has a clue what the bigger picture is yet. She means well. She has good intentions. But she's telling Jesus, I, this is what I know. This is what she studied and learned about her, her own time of learning the, the law and learning what Jesus is all about. And she believes that part. At least she says she does. But he goes, you don't have to wait for the end, Jesus. This is Jesus speaking. For I am right now resurrection and life. Now, did Jesus say that from his heart or from his soul? He said that from his heart. So it's a heart response to a soul statement. And he's saying, I am right now what you're talking about. I am the resurrection life. The one who believes in me, even though he or she dies, will live. And everyone who lives, believing in me, does not ultimately die at all. Do you believe this? And of course, she tries her best here, her best answer. Yes, Master, all, all along. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. And again, I would say to you, I believe she's speaking out of her mind right there, the best she can do. She hasn't caught it yet in her heart. And this is what's getting Jesus' attention, but she has no clue. But after saying this, guess, guess what Martha does? She goes to her sister Mary and whispers in her ear, the teacher is here and is asking for you, Mary. What Jesus would have loved to have heard right there, in my opinion, your, our friend is here, our friend. He's asking for us. He's asking for you, Mary. But she doesn't have a clue. And this is probably such a tender thing for Jesus to say, yeah, I'm the teacher, I'm the master, but I'm here as your friend. I'm here as the resurrection and the life. I'm the solution. I'm, I'm your friend. I'm not just someone who does magic tricks and what, and what they might have said was some kind of miraculous work. No, I'm somebody who is that life, that is that resurrection. But it says that the moment that Mary hears this, she jumps up, runs out to him. But notice, Jesus had not yet even entered the town. He was still at the place where Martha had met him. So when her sympathizing Jewish friends saw Mary run off, they followed her, and what were they thinking? They were thinking that Mary was on her way to the tomb to weep there. No, no, Mary came to where Jesus was waiting, and she fell at his feet saying, Master, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. And of course, she's as sincere as she can be, and she believes that, 
but it really gets to Jesus. And look at his response. I think you guys know what it is. When Jesus saw her sobbing, and the Jews with her sobbing, a deep anger welled up within him. And he said, where did you put him? Master, come and see, they said. Now Jesus wept. Everybody say, Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible, one of the most important verses in the Bible, because if you really look at the anger that Jesus demonstrates that wells up within him, why is there anger there? Why does he weep there? They, the Jews say, look how deeply he loved Lazarus. That's all true. But I believe, a lot of scholars believe this too, I believe that what the anger was all about is they don't have a clue to the opportunity that's in front of them because they're the friend of friends. That no one could be a better friend to them than him. And they don't have a clue that he's there as their friend. He's there as their solution. He's there as life. He's there as abundant life. He's there as the way to eternity. He's the way for Lazarus to never die. But they don't understand, and he weeps. And now, of course, I'm sure he's mourning for the whole process because he, he does grieve and ha feels the people's pain. But greater than that, he's saying, please, don't you see why I came? Don't you see that Father and I are one, and we have this conversation, and there's love for you? But they didn't understand. So there's an emotion here because... When God said he made you and me in his likeness, he gave you and me that same kind of emotion. And sometimes we want to push that off when we should be saying, Lord, that's a sign that you're doing something in my heart. Is that emotion moving toward your heart or is it moving toward my own way of thinking? As we said, Pastor Tom said in his message last week, where we have our mind overtaking what our heart already knows instead of our heart knowing what God's word has done in our life, overtaking and renewing our mind from the, from the standpoint of God's word. So tonight, this, tonight this, today, we're talking about how do you know God's heart? Do you understand his dream? Do you understand his dream right now? You have a little better understanding. There's a dream he has. And it's, it's, it's active right now today. His dream is active right now. It's not just Genesis. It's not just the Hebrew story. It's not just Martha and Mary. It's not just Peter. It's today. 2017, his dream is active right now. And, it's, and it has you in his mind, has me in his mind, in his heart. One of my favorite people in the Bible, and it has, there's something said about him with his heart. The name begins with a letter D. His name is David. And we know when Paul gave this great message in Acts chapter 13 to try to share, share what's going on here with God's new ways. How does this all work? Paul proclaims in chapter 13, verse 20, that God had given judges to them until the time of Samuel, the prophet. This is Paul pre preaching a message. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made, God made David their king. God testified concerning David. What does he say? I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, was David a perfect guy? <laughs> I love it. I'm glad they put David in the Bible. Oh, that's, that's, that's so encouraging. The guy messed up quite a bit. But there was something about even his mess-ups. God could still see David's heart the whole time. He's a man after my own heart. Was Enoch a man after God's own heart? Was Noah a man after God's own heart? Was Abraham a man after God's own heart? Was Rahab a, man, a lady after God's own heart? You see what I'm saying? It's all a part. Not about how much I can impress you with outwardly stuff, and believe me, not with my bald head, it ain't going to happen. But maybe God will say, but, but I see Randy's heart, and he, he has a lot of good intentions. I love him, and that's what he said felt about you. But Lord, I've messed up so many times. Yeah, but I see your heart right now. You're moving more toward me. But don't, don't draw back. Keep coming. I'm your friend. I'm the best friend you'll ever have. I know, Lord, but help me to grab it in my heart, not just in my soul. Come, friendy. Now, let me get a little deeper as we close today. There's something very precious about you in this room, and I didn't say that. God said it. Look, look at what Moses proclaimed in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 on PowerPoint. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Now, because of us being grafted in, because of what Jesus did for us. Do you realize this is about you and me too? It's about us. Everybody say, I am God's possession. Treasure, treasure. I am God's treasured possession. Say that. I am God's treasured possession. He looks at you as his treasure right now. He is so thrilled. You're his precious jewel. 
and he's chosen you out of all the people. Now, everybody, Jesus said, whoever, whoever wants to come can come. Everybody has an opportunity to come. But because we know not everyone will say yes to the Holy Spirit. How many of you said yes to the Holy Spirit at some time? How many are saying yes right now? You're his treasured possession. You know what he said? He said, told Jeremiah, that's for you and me. Chapter 29, verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. Seek me with all your mind. Seek me with all your soul. Those are all things that are part of the commandments. Seek me with your body. What does Jeremiah hear, hear from the Lord? Seek me with all your heart. It goes right back to the heart again. So when we seek God with all of our heart, and we seek his heart, we will find our friend. And he will know we've been found because you'll realize, man, not only did God find me as a friend, as I sang this morning, I am a friend of God. Now, we're going to turn a page, and I'm going to give you the clue. Remember you wrote at the bottom of your notes the first point, that God had a dream to create, give you life. How many remember that? You wrote that down. I hope most of you did, right? And you said, when you wrote it down, he not only gave you life, he created you in his likeness. Is that true? But here's really what his dream is. Are you ready for it? And it's in Exodus chapter 29 and verse 43. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's what we're going to close with today in Revelation. It's the ultimate dream God has, and it's right now available, and it's a part of your life sitting in that seat right now, and me sitting up here, not standing, so, so, Fra so, so Frankie's happy with me today. No, here it is. God is speaking, and Moses is recording this, this incredible word from God. And there I, the Lord, will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Exodus 29. So I will consecrate the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate both Aaron and his sons to minister to me as priests. I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. Everybody say, I may dwell among them. One more time. I may dwell among them. And that's the, the biggest clue you're going to get right now to what God's ultimate dream is. Yes, he wants you to know he wanted you to be here, and he wanted you to be on this planet. He had a plan for you. He, he wanted you to be created. He created you gave you life, gave me life, and did create you and me in his likeness. But the key to everything is he wants to dwell with you. He wants to dwell with you right now, sitting beside you in that seat in where you are right now, on the way home. And here's how the dream is still coming true today, because let's go back to that passage in Hebrews and chapter with Abraham, and let me go back to that thing that Abraham was waiting for. What was Abraham waiting for? Look at this again in verse 8 of chapter 11. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promises in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Why was Abraham waiting for this? Why, what was so important that caused Abraham to wait? And why did God want this to be known in Hebrews 11? It's very, very significant. It's very significant based on what we just read in Exodus, that he was, said that he was going to meet the children of Israel in the tabernacle and that he would sanctify it by his glory. He would consecrate the tabernacle. Then, he's, then all of a sudden we're hearing from Abraham in Hebrews 11 that he was waiting for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Do you know, when I say that this dream is for all of us here today, sometimes we forget what Abraham was promised because you and I are part of that promise. It goes on to say in verse 11, by faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child. Was Sarah really young when she bore a child? Was she kind of up there in age? Okay. Well, when she was, she, it says she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, how, was, was Abraham about as good as dead? Was born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. You all remember when God promised Abraham that out of your life, 
will become all these descendants, as many as you can look up and see these stars, there's more. You and I are one of those stars right now. Do you know that? You and I are one of those grains of sand, precious treasures, because of what Jesus did for us. We're his friend. But do you understand? You're wa- are you waiting for something like Abraham is waiting? You will if you, th- if you catch this in a moment, and you're going to see that this is about to be a part of why we come to church every Sunday, why we worship. God has found many friends who he wants to be with forever. Does everybody say, God has found many friends who he wants to be with forever? Through what we just read from Abraham and Sarah, we all became a part, not just one friend like Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and all the people in Hebrews 11, and all the people who died in between. There were special people that God points out because their heart is attracted to God's heart. If we understand who we are in Christ, And what Jesus did for us at the cross, and he said, if we would just call on the name of the Lord and believe that God, Father God, raised him from the dead, we would be able to believe in our heart, not in our soul, but in our heart, then we would confess with our mouth and we'd receive that salvation. We can be a part of being one of those friends. And every one of you in this room that have done that are part of that friendship. So I I I conclude with this verse. For Abraham, God's friend, waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What was he waiting for? When there was a moment in Genesis where God shows Abraham something, we still don't know what he showed Abraham, but it says when he saw what God showed him, he fell. How did he fall? He fell on his face. Who else fell on their face in the Bible? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Try to stand up here right now, don't do it, but try to stand up and fall on your face. Not too easy to do. Unless something overwhelms you to where you can't stand up any longer. Something overwhelmed Abraham to the level that he fell on his face. What did he see? Is it possible he saw what Hebrews 11 said? He's waiting for a city. Well, we know one thing. There was a man named John who God showed a picture that was similar. But we still think we know what God is all about with his dream. We still miss it. Because in Revelation 21, 1 through 3, look what John saw. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We know one thing. It's real similar, evidently, to what Abraham was waiting for that John actually sees in in Revelation. But we still haven't got it yet. It's not what he saw. It's what he heard. What do you mean, Randy? Look at the next verse. This is what he heard. I talked about hearing God's audible voice on the way home. But can you hear what John heard? He he heard a voice from heaven. John heard this. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Everybody say, with men. He will dwell with them. Everybody say, dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them. Everybody say, God will be with them. And be their God. Here's God's dream for you and me today, and it's it's for eternity. He wants to be with you. So your second statement is a simple statement on the bottom of your notes. And God's ultimate dream for me, if you write, look down at your, your, your spaces down there, and God's ultimate dream for me is that he wants to be with me. He wants to be with me. Would you, would you bow your head? Close your eyes.